Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Paul Wesson, and I am the I am an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics and the new Associate Director for Science for IGHS. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this morning's to this afternoon, sorry, IGHS Grand Rounds, where we are very fortunate to be joined by Dr. Monica Gandhi, who will speak to us about the various WHO approved COVID-19 vaccines, including their scientific basis and their efficacy, as well as other therapeutics. But first, I would like to introduce Dr. Kelly Sanders, who is an alum of our Global Health Master's Program, a pediatrician at Stanford, and the technical lead of the Pandemic Response Initiative at IGHS. Dr. Sanders will provide us with a brief overview of the state of the world with respect to COVID before turning the program over to Dr. Gandhi. Dr. Sanders, the proverbial floor is yours. Hi, thanks so much, Paul. Uh, it's absolutely our pleasure to have you as the new director for science at IGHS. And um, as Paul mentioned, I'm Kelly Sanders and I'm the technical lead of the Pandemic Response Initiative. So two years into the COVID-19 pandemic with a new variant barreling down the pipeline, it's clear that COVID is here to stay. To date, 5.26 million people have died from the disease and that's likely a significant underestimate. There is no silver bullet to change the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, and it will continue to require a multi-pronged approach to minimize the health, social, and economic costs. Today, we will talk about exciting advances in COVID, excuse me, global COVID-19 treatments and vaccines. Given IGHS's work around the world, including projects that send students abroad and others that have team members on the ground, understanding this landscape is critical to our work. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Monica Gandhi, an infectious diseases doctor, professor of medicine, and associate chief in the division of HIV, infectious diseases, and global medicine here at UCSF. She is also the director of the UCSF Center for AIDS Research and the medical director of the HIV clinic Ward 86, which I remember um, and is close to my heart from medical school at UCSF at SF General Hospital. Her research focuses on HIV and women and adherence to measurement in HIV treatment and prevention. And most recently, she has also focused on how to mitigate the COVID-19 pandemic through harm reduction strategies. Monica was one of my mentors in the UCSF Masters of Science in Global Health program, so it's my absolute pleasure to welcome her. Dr. Lucia Abascal, a physician and current UCSF Global Health PhD student, will moderate questions, questions and answers after the presentation. Dr. Abascal is currently working on COVID-19 implementation and social behavioral science research and works extensively with the CDPH and SFDPH on COVID-19 communication projects. This is our first time trying a hybrid grand rounds and we have the master students all in a room together at Mission Hall. Thank you, Robert, for setting this up and bear with us um, if there are any small glitches. Please place any of your questions in the question and answer box um, on Zoom and I will collect those for Drs. Gandhi and Abascal. Dr. Gandhi, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, and I look forward to this talk where I am trying to put all the global vaccines together, um, which was a good exercise for me to learn all the ins and outs of the other global vaccines after thinking about the ones um, here in available in the United States uh, for so long. So um, I'm gonna try to go through all of them and at least as many as we can get through and also two of the treatments um, that are coming and discuss the concept of COVID-19 control. So, you know, just to take a little step back here, um, the SARS pandemic, uh, which was really between 2002, 2003, didn't need a vaccine, but it was the time where we had another severe coronavirus uh, circulating in the world, but it was so much more limited. 8,100 cases, 774 deaths, only 29 cases in the US. And the second time we've ever seen a coronavirus turn severe was the MERS pandemic in 2012. Also much more limited. All, both of them likely came from bats, so did SARS-CoV-2, um, but through some animal, in this case, it was the camel, SARS was through um, palm civet, we don't know about SARS-CoV-2. And it essentially was extremely limited and didn't need a vaccine. 
And then SARS-CoV-2 happened. And this really was reported to the WHO on December 31st, 2019 from Wuhan. Um, by January 7th, it had been identified as a coronavirus. It's been spreading around the world, obviously, ever since. On January 30th, the WHO called a global health emergency. And on March 11th, it was labeled a pandemic. March 26th, the US actually became the epicenter of the pandemic. And except for a short period of time when India was the epicenter, uh, US, because of multiple reasons, including politics, has, has continued to be the epicenter and in fact has more deaths than any other uh, place. Um, December 11th, the first EUA for the first COVID-19 vaccine came out in the US. That was for the Pfizer vaccine. And we are approaching the one year anniversary. We are approaching a one year anniversary without global vaccine equity, which I'll talk about. So these are the, the essentially the um, nine vaccines to discuss. And there are nine vaccines, but actually only seven of them are yet approved by the World Health Organization. The two that are not are grayed out here. One is Novavax, which is likely to get approved quite soon. And one is Sputnik V, which I don't actually quite understand why it's not approved and neither does Russia. Um, and I'll talk about that. The others, I will talk about their pros and cons in a minute, um, but essentially uh, the top six are all spike protein vaccines. So in some way they either use genetic material that code for the spike protein, or in the case of Novavax, it's actually given, giving the spike protein, it's a protein with an adjuvant. And then the three at the bottom, Cinefarm, Cinevac, and the Covaxin product from Bharat Pharmaceuticals are whole inactivated variants. So that's how we distinguish um, them. And then there are vaccines used around the world. For example, Cuba has its own protein adjuvant, but it's not approved by the WHO and it's only being used in Cuba. And that is true of other homegrown vaccines around the world. But we're gonna talk about the WHO um, uh, um, approved ones. So when I said there were seven, I said Novavax and Sputnik V have not been approved. And actually COVID Shield is really the AstraZeneca formulation in India. So that really counts as one vaccine. So there's the AstraZeneca formulation, there's the Cinevac and the Cinefarm, there's the Covaxin, and then there's the three that you're so familiar with, which is approved, which are approved in this country, or at least authorized the Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson. And so I will talk about these in succession. Just to remind ourselves again, how does the mRNA vaccines work? Really what they do is they code for the spike protein. So the mRNA is put in a lipid bilayer. And of course the spike protein is this little piece of the virus that sticks out and sticks to the host cell. And remember the spike protein, just like spike proteins of influenza, like the H&N spike proteins are most likely to mutate. Um, the, the part that affects, that interacts with our host cell the most. But these spike proteins, um, the, the types of vaccines that influence the, that in some way use the spike protein are the two mRNA vaccines. And that's just really an mRNA that codes for a piece of the spike protein. It's not actually the same piece of the spike protein. Um, and it's surrounded by a lipid bilayer. And these are novel vaccines, never been used yet for pathogens, have been tried for tumors and were developed for MERS, um, but didn't need them. And these mRNA vaccines are novel, but we've now had uh, good data on them for a year and um, in the real world and for a year and a half since the trials. The Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, and Sputnik vaccines are all the DNA of, of a piece of the spike protein, and they're encapsulated inside a benign adenovirus that doesn't actually replicate in the human body. Um, and so that's just the vector to bring it in. And then the same thing, uncoats DNA, goes to mRNA, mRNA goes to a piece of the spike protein, and then you raise an immune response against it because this is such a foreign material to you that you raise T cells and antibodies against the spike protein. And then the Novavax is literally just the protein itself with an adjuvant, which is a more common vaccine design, a more traditional vaccine design, um, like tetanus and diphtheria and pertussis. And this is the type of vaccine that in some way we're waiting for because it could be um, it could be helpful for people who are still predominantly uh, vaccine hesitant against the, the DNA and the RNA vaccines. So 
we have to remind ourselves when we know how these work, because I'm going to tell you how they work, but I'm going to tell you how well they work. But we have to remind ourselves of the immune system and what are they raising? Um, because there's been a lot of talk about Omicron and about symptomatic disease versus severe disease, and it really behooves us to remind ourselves of the immune system. So um, they all raise antibodies. Uh, in fact, um, that was easy to measure that they raise neutralizing antibodies, but all the phase one, two clinical trials of all of the vaccines actually took the trouble and measured T cell immunity, and they all raised strong T cell immunity, all nine of these vaccine candidates that we're talking about. And of course, the CD4 uh, cell response, the TH1 ratio, uh, a TH1 predominant CD4 cell response is the most, really our major immune defense against viruses. And T cells can last a very long time after vaccines. For example, measles vaccines, 34 years and later, you can get T cells, this original SARS pandemic of those who have survived 17 years later, they still have strong T cell immunity against the SARS-CoV virus. B cells um, are also produced by the vaccines. Antibodies are as well, but so are B cells. We know that bone marrow biopsies from those who are infected show B cells. We know that lymph node biopsies of those who've had the vaccines show B cell formation in the terminal centers. And B cells will make antibodies in the future if you need them. So even though your antibodies will decline and they absolutely will decline from your time since your original infection or the time since your vaccine, because we cannot keep all that uh, antibody in our bloodstream. We can't keep, uh, it's too much protein. Essentially, um, antibodies will absolutely not a glitch. It will go down, um, but your B cells aided by your T cells will be able to produce more um, antibodies. And it's really the T cell response that modulates the severity of disease. So a strong T cell response is why we're seeing such persistent effectiveness against severe disease of actually all the vaccines, except two that I'm going to talk about uh, the WHO approved a third dose for, and that's likely because of T cell immunity. And as I told you, all of the vaccines took the trouble, and this is in column four, to um, measure both T cells and neutralizing antibodies in their original phase one or two trials. And then large clinical trials were performed of all of these vaccines as shown in the fifth column. And these are the numbers of individuals that were studied. And then the sixth column shows you that actually in terms of, at least for the clinical trials, they were all almost 100% protective against COVID-19 hospitalizations and COVID-19 deaths. So that really shows you the power of T-cell immunity. Things will decline with time, but this was the original clinical trial data of all of the vaccine candidates. And then there was more variability against variants and against more mild disease um, in all of the clinical trials. This was true of the three whole inactivated variants. They also initially showed 100% protection against severe disease, with declines again over time, but these were the clinical trial results. So will vaccines work against variants? It really, we have to consider T and B cell immunity for a minute before we go into the results of each of these clinical trials, because it will explain to you um, what is happening with the variability between the different vaccine candidates. So um, we've heard a lot about variants uh, prior to just uh, 10 days ago, the four predominant variants of concern were alpha, which um, none of these were, we know, we don't know where any of these originated. So they shouldn't be called by any name um, of which they were first described. And so that's why the WHO went to Greek letter um, system to describe the variants. But the alpha was, was the first, actually there was a first one called the D614G that replaced the ancestral strain over last summer, but it was not noticed as much as these variants. And then alpha beta was pretty restricted in the world, not really widespread. Gamma was also pretty restricted and Delta has become the predominant variant in the world since um, it was first described in India uh, at the beginning of March and led to really severe disease there. Um, and then the Omicron variant um, was just described. Now we have um, almost two weeks, actually, as of tomorrow is two weeks of the first time that we heard about it. This was described by South African scientists, really an amazing amount of work by them to describe this. Um, but unfortunately, it led to a really profound chilling of the economy, of, of a lot of panic and immediate uh, in reward, immediate travel bans. Um, 
uh, clamped onto Sub-Saharan Africa, even though it's been found in 52 countries since, and there's been no travel bans on any countries, um, other countries, but in Sub-Saharan Africa by the US and the UK. So that's unfair. Um, and uh, in terms of its transmissibility, it, we don't know if it's more transmissible yet. On the other hand, it has actually now, it now, even over this period of time, which is almost two weeks, it, it is the variant that is ta that is 70, represents 76% of the genomes in South Africa. So that's suggestive that it is replacing Delta, uh, certainly there. Um, it has been found in 53 countries around the world, um, including, of course, the US. And um, the Omicron variant could be more transmissible. I think that is a very likely thing, that it's more transmissible. However, and this is just sort of, it's now been two weeks and this story hasn't changed, that it doesn't seem like it causes more severe disease than Delta. And in fact, actually it seems to cause more mild disease with a lot of the patients in the hospital in South Africa after the initial week described as having COVID in their nose because it's a very transmissible variant and everyone is swabbed, but actually being there for other things. And that was 75% of the, of the patients. Um, in, in large South African hospitals. So it does look like it's more mild. And I think that's kind of sticking at least over these first two weeks of data. And then in terms of it evading the vaccines, this is really just a description that um, is based on antibodies. And again, we, we wanna know immunology better than just antibodies. Um, but at least as of, and this is updated every two days, at least the epidemiologic update from the CDC equivalent in the European uh, uh, of, of in Europe um, keeps on updating every two days all the cases that they can describe around the world, um, except in, sub in Sub-Saharan Africa that are being described separately, the unvaccinated individuals. And these are likely more vaccinated individuals, but all cases so far are either asymptomatic or mild of the Omicron variant. So good news in terms of likely not breaking through the vaccines to any significant degree. And even though there'll be neutralizing antibody data that was presented yesterday, for example, from a lab, um, again, about Omicron being the neutralizing antibodies being down because there's 32 um, mutations across the spike protein with the Omicron variant, we know that if we look more deeply than that, that there's a very broad T cell repertoire that develops across the entire spike protein when you give the vaccines. For example, the AstraZeneca vaccine, its original trial was un very unfortunately stopped in South Africa because it didn't protect against mild disease as much as it did against severe disease. But when they went and looked back at that trial, this was published in the New England Journal, um, there were 87 T cells that were formed across the piece of the spike protein that AstraZeneca codes for. And so even though the beta variant had um, mutations, the Omicron variant has 32 mutations, 87 T cells, you can't overwhelm that even with, with 32 mutations, you still have 50 or so T cells lined up that you get from the AstraZeneca vaccine that protect you against severe disease, which is likely why the vaccines are still holding up for protection against severe disease. And this has been shown by um, UCSF and the La Jolla Institute of Immunology and others that put basically T cells from the vaccines in the blood with uh, variants and see really strong T cell immunity. This has also been done for the Omicron variant just in the last week. But in terms of the protection against mild infection, that really is a function of the vaccine, which will now we're gonna go through the different vaccines. So which vaccine you've used, um, they all seem to stimulate strong T cell immunity, but which vaccines you use in terms of antibodies. Um, uh, it also depends on being overwhelmed by a lot of virus. So high levels of circulating virus. In India, they had, many people had two of what they call Covishield, which is their AstraZeneca vaccine. But unfortunately, healthcare workers who are surrounded by a lot of virus still became ill um, because it, it isn't just a function of the vaccine and you as a host, for example, immunocompromised patients or people of older age may need extra doses because they're less, they're more susceptible to severe breakthroughs, but it also depends on demographic factors like being surrounded by virus. And so it really is a very complicated thing to weigh vaccine effectiveness in the real world, unlike vaccine efficacy that I'll tell you next about that revealed in the clinical trials. However, when Pfizer, when the FDA first was asked to re review the question of, of, of if we need boosters for all in this country, they actually put up this slide 
that showed us that across 74 studies across the planet, at least the mRNA vaccines, which they were specifically looking at, and then also the AstraZeneca vaccine were holding up really well in its protection against severe disease. And that was the two dose vaccines. So whenever we talk about effectiveness, we have to think about what phenotype are we looking at in terms of protection. And that really is a function of the B cells. What will happen is that your antibodies will go up if you have a vaccine or an infection. They will absolutely go down with time. Your B cells have been produced, but it will take a few days for you to produce new antibodies from your B cells. And at that point, because antibodies are your main layer of protection in your nose um, and in the upper respiratory tract, you may develop a mild symptomatic illness with COVID-19. And that's why, um, uh, the, the intolerance of mild symptomatic infections have led to boosters in the, um, in the rich world and not led to boosters in, in low-income settings. And we'll talk about that when we go to the WHO guidelines. Um, but interestingly, and I think this is really important, when your B cells make antibodies, if they see the virus again in the future, they will actually adapt their antibodies to be directed against the variant they see because they are a recipe book, but they are very happy to change the recipe if they need to and actually adapt their variants, adapt their antibodies against the variant they see. And this is a nice science paper from a month ago. And there's actually three or four papers now, one from OHSU, one from Journal of Infectious Disease just this week, and one from Science a month ago showing this ability of memory B cells to um, produce antibodies that are adapted towards the variants. So now let's talk about specific vaccines. And, you know, um, it is important to remember where we are in the world, especially with an emergence of a new variant. We are um, in a profound setting of global vaccine inequity. So of 8.24 billion doses administered worldwide, uh, only 6.3% of those doses have been given to low-income countries. We are in probably one of the greatest moral, ethical, and public health failings of, of, of human history. And in terms of how the vaccines are being given out and which countries have the most vaccines given out, actually Cuba has vaccinated most of its population. Um, it decided on its own homegrown vaccine. It knew because of sanctions that they would not be given vaccines. And as you can tell, actually, it's very hard to be given vaccines by high income countries that are hoarding the vaccines. And so because of that, they are actually the most highly vaccinated um, country in the world. That's followed by UAE and then the UK and then the EU in general followed closely by the US and then sort of lower, much, much lower vaccination rates globally and, uh, uh, and um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And these are representing all the light areas of the low-income countries that have so little vaccine access and some vaccine hesitancy, but much more limitations in vaccine access. In terms of how the vaccines are being used, it would have been nice actually if the WHO had um, approved the Sputnik V vaccine, because this was a vaccine that that particular country was actually willing to give out to multiple countries, but has been stymied by the WHO not approving this vaccine. Um, Sinopharm and Sinovac, which are likely less effective than um, the Sputnik V vaccine, have been given out much more widely because they're on the WHO list. Uh, Pfizer and um, and the Moderna vaccine, you can see a profound shift towards uh, the high income world. And then, um, and then AstraZeneca has been probably the most fair in terms of distribution around the planet um, with 2 billion of the 8 billion doses being the AstraZeneca vaccine. That was partially because of initial production by, um, by India, but then when India suffered its second wave, they closed down any production for the rest of the world. So we won't go over all the details of the clinical trials or effectiveness now, because we won't have time. So I'm not gonna actually give you the original clinical trial data of Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson, um, but just tell you how they're doing now, because a lot has changed in the world as we get away from our antibodies coming down from our original vaccines. And, um, and then I will tell you about the other six vaccines. So to just summarize a lot of data, 
This was data that was presented at September 24th in the CDC. And the two-dose Moderna and Pfizer vaccines are actually holding up very well in terms of preventing hospitalizations from COVID-19. Moderna, 93% protection. Pfizer, 88% protection. But the Johnson & Johnson one-dose vaccine simply wasn't enough. It is only 71% protective against hospitalizations and really needs a second dose, which makes sense. Only yellow fever vaccine is, is really given once a once as a lifetime, and even that, if you go into high prevalence reason, regions, you need another. So it's not common to have a one dose vaccine, and the Johnson Johnson definitely needs to be boosted or given a second dose. There's a lot of data from the NIH, from the UK, from Italy, from Spain, and now from Sweden, even clinical data and um, laboratory data that giving a DNA vaccine followed by an mRNA vaccine is probably the for whatever magical reason is the most prof uh, is the best boost to give, essentially. So AstraZeneca followed by an mRNA vaccine or Johnson & Johnson followed by an mRNA vaccine, at least namely in terms of um, increases in antibodies and even T cells in one study. And we have persistent data from the United States that being vaccinated, and again, we know the three vaccines that we have in this country, is associated with the lowest risk of hospitalization. You're 66 times more likely to get hospitalized in LA right now um, in the time of Delta than if you're unvaccinated, then vaccinated. And this is just the CDC plot overall till the end of October, that certainly there are severe breakthrough infections that can occur among mostly um, people who are older or immunocompromised or multiple medical conditions, but far and away vaccination is the single most important protection that you have against being hospitalized for COVID-19. And this is data from New York across the three vaccines that we have in this country. So again, this is as close as I can get to real world effectiveness data to this point in time. So this was the end of August that showed that actually Johnson Johnson absolutely needs a second dose like we discussed, but the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine actually protected very well against severe disease up to the age of 64. And then after 65, there was slightly waning effectiveness, um, which is why I think the FDA originally really wanted to boost over 65 year old individuals. So then let's go to the three um, uh, other spike protein vaccines. And what do we know about them? Well, the AstraZeneca vaccine, this was the original clinical trials. There's actually um, four pooled trials together published in The Lancet. And um, at initial onset, it was essentially 76% effective. Uh, sorry, it had 76% efficacy and also 100% protective against severe outcomes, like I showed you in that initial um, table at the beginning. Now, with time, uh, vaccine effectiveness goes down, but it depends on how it was given. Even in the original trials, the longer you had of a duration between doses, the, um, the more effective the vaccine was. And that's just true of actually all vaccines, which is why so many people were urging the United States and Israel to actually extend the duration between their Pfizer doses, but that wasn't a strategy chosen um, in these countries. So they stuck with the three week duration, but most countries, including Canada, that's put out the best data um, has shown us that having a longer interval between doses gives higher, uh, gives better effectiveness. And we knew this sort of immunologically, but this is a cell paper from very recently that shows with the Pfizer vaccine that if you extend it from three weeks to six to eight weeks, you not only get a better antibody response, but actually importantly, um, better T cell responses, which are going to be long lasting. And this is the data out of Canada that shows that they chose to give all their vaccines, whether it was AstraZeneca followed by Pfizer or two Pfizer's or two AstraZeneca's, eight to 12 weeks apart. And at least with the Pfizer vaccine specifically, it was 82% effective if given three weeks apart, but 92% effective if given 12 weeks apart. And that was even against mild reinfection, likely because of the increased antibodies with the increased spacing between doses. Um, so AstraZeneca has been given, of those 8.15 billion doses given out worldwide, actually 2 billion of them have, 25%, have been the AstraZeneca supply. And so this is a good vaccine. It does, it, it has some storage um, uh, and distribution advantages um, in that it could be stored in a refrigerator for a long time and um, doesn't need to be as kept as cold as the mRNA vaccines. 
Um, and it is a good vaccine, but it is a good vaccine in terms of protecting against severe disease. So it's antibody production, at least if it's given to close together as well, is likely not as high um, as the mRNA vaccines, but it's durable protection against severe disease um, has been demonstrated. So, and that's recommended as a two-dose vaccine by the WHO. So what about the Sputnik vaccine? Well, the Sputnik vaccine um, was published in the Lancet. Um, it was a large phase three clinical trial, just as large as any other clinical trial. It's two doses given three weeks apart, and they also have data on a one-dose Sputnik FAST vaccine. This was a very diverse patient population, not in terms of race or ethnicity, but in terms of having um, comorbidities that were associated with severe COVID. And essentially, it was 91% uh, efficacious in the clinical trial and 100% efficacious against severe disease. Now, this is a vaccine that is cost less than $10 for one dose. It's a dry vaccine, so it can be really shipped readily. And, um, and Russia has attempted to give this vaccine out to the world, but the WHO has not yet approved it. It keeps on saying that we're going to approve it or we're thinking about it, but they just have it. And it's a very interesting um, phenomenon that's happening actually, because uh, there's really mounting evidence. Uh, this is a nature paper that it's really safe and effective. Um, it's been used in 70 countries, but not in huge amounts because of the WHO not being approval, not being approved. And it's um, and it fundamentally um, has the same side effect profile as all three of the um, DNA vaccines, the Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, and Sputnik V, which are very rare clots. And they've been transparent with their data. And, um, and the Sputnik developers have accused the EU of being biased and citing a comment from the EU Internal Market Commissioner in March that, that the quote, the EU has absolutely no need of Sputnik V. So I will say that this is something that's been very confusing to me, um, why this is not approved by the WHO. And um, luckily this has been actually something really important for India because uh, Russia and India have a, have a relationship and Russia has exported 250 million doses of Sputnik V vaccine in India which is really important in their mass vaccination campaign. So I'll leave it at that. I don't know what the politics is there. What about Novavax? Well, Novavax is a great vaccine. It is a protein with an adjuvant. It was published, its trial results were published in the New England Journal Study on September 24th. It's approved in Indonesia. It's 90% effective uh, against any symptomatic disease. It was 93% effective against variants actually, um, though it, Delta was just starting when it's Trial, trial stopped. And it's 100% protected against severe disease, even moderate disease. It has been approved in Indonesia. It's moving forward in India. And EU just made an announcement. The EMA, which is the EMA, is the European Medicines Agency, which is our kind of like our, well, it's, it's, who, it's our FDA, essentially. They just made an announcement today that they are going to approve this very soon. So I think this is going to be a huge advance for those who are um, concerned about the mRNA or DNA vaccines because of misinformation. And um, it also can stay stable at transport at room temperature as opposed to having to be kept cold for 24 hours. So I think it has a huge advance in low-income countries. So I'm very excited about the Novavax vaccine. Okay, let's go to the three whole inactivated virion vaccines. So the first one is, um, is Covaxin. And this is a product that's made by an Indian company named Bharat. And it is, um, it, they did publish, uh, and actually this was great that it published because unlike Cinefarm or Cinevac, who have not published big phase three trials, there's a lot of announcements, but the pub, we don't have a great phase three um, peer reviewed publication to look at with those two vaccines. This is a Lancet study and um, it looked at over 25,000 participants some on placebo, most on the vaccine. And Covaxin, with a whole inactivated virion given at two doses, was overall 78% protective against symptomatic disease, 93% effective against severe disease. It was 65% protect, protective against Delta variant because it was being um, announced and its phase three trial was, was ending um, when the Delta variant was hitting India. So they didn't have that, this was, they didn't have a very high number, um, but that's, that's possibly true against symptomatic Delta. And in terms of the two um, 
uh, Chinese made vaccines. One is Sinovac. And there was a relatively, uh, this was a phase three trial published from Turkey um, that actually was in the Lancet. And with Sinovac, it showed an 83% effectiveness against symptomatic disease and 100% against severe disease. But the trial results that we're waiting for that was only announced as a press release um, uh, was a phase three trial in Brazil with the Sinovac product. And in this case, the Brazil trial showed much less efficacy. It was actually 50.4%, which was just sort of barely above what it would take to get approved. Um, and unfortunately, we, we again don't have yet a, a peer-reviewed publication on that um, to review. I kept on looking for it. Um, in terms of the Sinopharm product, uh, there is a combined analysis that was published in, the, in JAMA that looked at in Bahrain and the UAE from September to December 31st, so this is of course in advance of the variants, um, looked, or at least of the Delta variant, looked at, um, it just performed an interim analysis of the two vaccines. So it was two dose vaccines, either Sinopharm or Sinovac, and they didn't split out the data versus placebo. And then this graph shows you um, the split between the Sinovac and Sinopharm. But the overall, if I combine it, it's basically there were 72% of efficacious against symptomatic disease and 98% of efficacious against severe disease. But we haven't had updated analyses um, in the context of Delta. And because of that, um, you know, this just happened two days ago, but there's been quite a concern about the efficacy of those particular two vaccines. And I think it was the 50.4% efficacy that, that was released in a press release from Brazil that has led to so much concern about these two vaccines. Um, this was just from two days ago from Financial Times that 2.5 billion doses of Sinopharm um, or Sinovac have been given out, but and and actually a large number of those have been in um, uh, mostly Latin America. So 1.2 billion doses of them have been given out outside of China, but um, there's real doubts, unfortunately, about the efficacy of these vaccines, and those doubts actually ended up. Uh, revealing themselves um, in October when the WHO for the first time recommended that these vaccines are not enough um, as two-dose vaccines and that a third dose is needed. And that is actually very unexpected for the WHO because they have been very, very violently opposed to boosting uh, populations, boosting um, high income settings to prevent more mild infections when we haven't even given out doses to prevent healthcare workers and vulnerable people to, from dying in other countries. And that is their job to be um, so strident about global vaccine equity. But they did approve in October a third, vac a third shot. And they basically said any, it can be any shot um, to the um, Sinopharm and Sinovac products. So that's the only vaccine that they have approved a third shot. They've actually approved a third shot for all immunocompromised patients, but this was specifically for anyone over 60 for Sinovac, Sinopharm. And basically um, that, that will have huge implications because there's many people over 60 um, in, in the large country of China. So it really, um, uh, it really was a lack, kind of a showing not as much confidence in these vaccines. So to put it all together then, um, the Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson essentially are all WHO supported. Uh, even though they say one dose for Johnson & Johnson, I think it has to be two. And I think the two doses are just fine for Moderna and Pfizer. I completely understand the booster conversation with Omicron. I completely understand that high-income countries are protecting their own, but it really, um, they're showing really very good protection against severe disease as we talked about. AstraZeneca, Novavax, and Sputnik. Um, Sputnik V is not approved by the WHO. I have no idea why, and I think it's politics. Novavax is soon to be WHO supported. I think that's going to be an amazing vaccine. Uh, AstraZeneca is WHO supported. Sinopharm and Sinovac have been had a mark of no confidence with the at least the two dose vaccines and do need a third dose. And then the Covaxin product is supported uh, as a two dose vaccine by the WHO. And that's where we are in the world. And so I wanna finish with treatment um, so we can get to questions and finish with the idea of oral antivirals because we're talking about global vaccine equity and we're talking about global treatment equity. 
And if we can't even get equity in the dispensation of monoclonal antibodies in this country among low-income groups, we are likely monoclonal antibodies, which is an outpatient treatment for COVID-19, are not going to be dispensed widely. We need pills. We need short outpatient pill courses um, to, to get to control. Because um, as uh, Kelly said at the beginning of this talk, we're not going to eliminate or eradicate COVID-19. And any that is a that is a implausible goal. Um, actually, the only um, virus that we've ever eliminated in humans is smallpox, eradicated at least, and in, in cattle is something called rinderpest, but we don't, we don't eradicate, uh, it's not very easy to eradicate infections. And, um, but we're going to get to control with COVID. And you could argue that in a city of 900,000 in San Francisco, with 15 people in the hospital overall over the entire city, that we are at control. And so what is, um, what is, what are the features of COVID that make it non-eradicable? And essentially it's that it doesn't have the four features of smallpox, which were having no animal reservoir. COVID has animal reservoirs. Smallpox, when you saw smallpox, it looked exactly smallpox. It was nothing else. And when you see COVID, it can be a number of different respiratory pathogen pathogens. Uh, smallpox had a small period of infectiousness and COVID-19 has a longer period of infectiousness. And then smallpox had a highly effective vaccine. So does COVID-19, maybe not um, as perfect as smallpox. And beyond that, it we don't have universal uptake of the vaccine, partially because of our moral and ethical failings and other, and also because of lack of vaccine uptake in some high income countries like the United States. So what about these two antiviral therapeutics that are coming out? And I think that um, these are exciting actually. And I think that, that, that I wrote this piece for the Atlantic, but I think that they're, that they're a bigger deal than people realize. And, um, and when we think about how we get infections under control, well, one example is measles, which is only under control from a, from a vaccine, which we may lose control, unfortunately, because uh, we've given out 23 million less vaccines this year because of COVID. But pertussis, which is a bacterial infection, is controlled by two means. It's controlled by a preventative, which is a vaccine, and, and also having antibiotics, macrolides available for it. And so having treatment for those who've declined to be vaccinated while we're waiting for vaccines to go everywhere, or even for moderate breakthrough infections with those who are vaccinated would be tremendously important advance. And you want a treatment that is orally given and is easy and is hopefully globally accessible. So molnupiravir is one, it's a nucleoside analog. It brings down the viral load quickly. Um, but remember about molnupiravir, it is a nucleoside analog shown up here on the right, but it isn't it wasn't actually designed specifically for SARS-CoV-2. I kind of think of this as like the easy key of HIV. It was pulled off a shelf being used for something else. It's going to be used for Ebola. And then they tried it in, um, in COVID-19. And this is the move out study. Um, and this is approved now more than two days ago. It was about 10 days ago. But this is the move out study that um, looked at patients who were not hospitalized because it was actually tried in hospitalized patients. And by that time, there's so much inflammation that really mild to moderate COVID, non-vaccinated, who had, or at least who were studied, who had a risk factor for going to severe COVID. And the risk of hospitalizations and deaths were reduced by 30%. And that was actually a revamped analysis from the initial 50%. So it is important to say that it, it's good. It's not like amazing, but it's good. And it is kind of the AZT. And then here's the um, lopinavir or the sequinavir or the nofinavir. Here's the protease inhibitor. Here's the first protease inhibitor for SARS-CoV-2. And this is 332, which is a product from Pfizer. And it's combined with ritonavir. Remember, it is 100 milligrams twice a day. So there is going to be a drug-drug interaction issue for five days, but it's only five days. And it was also given to high-risk non-hospitalized patients who are unvaccinated with moderate disease. And essentially, it found... Um, it, it showed that there was an 89% protection from severe disease, from hospitalization and death. 89% protection is rivaling that of a vaccine. So I'm pretty excited about Paxlovid. It's five days. And the one thing that Pfizer did um, uh, to maybe salvage its reputation a little bit is that Molnupiravir had joined Medicine's patent pool to say that they'll make their drug globally accessible. And Pfizer, after resisting a lot of issues with patent waivers, um, for its vaccine, 
um, did actually join the Medicines patent pool. So hopefully this will be more globally available. And um, I will actually, since there's so many questions, I will stop, but I wanna show you one more thing um, that we're interested in, just a little bit more about global vaccine equity because, um, because we are starting a movement here. Um, and the movement that we're starting is an attempt to be multi-academic institution. And we just started it this week. Um, and um, I'm hoping that IGHS will be willing to join. Um, and so this movement that we started um, uh, just the other day, essentially, is to form a consortium across academic medical universities to advocate for global vaccine, not just global equity, not just global vaccine equity, but global COVID, COVID equity. And so um, we have called it White Coats for Global COVID Equity. And right now, the institutions that have joined are UCSF, Harvard, UW, UCLA, and um, UC Davis. And our six sort of platforms are to advocate for patent waivers, um, to advocate for donations instead of wasting of doses, uh, to advocate for manufacturing capacity, philanthropy and discriminatory travel bans and strengthened health systems like PEPFAR strengthened HIV healthcare systems. And um, the reason that we've um, advocated so hard for this is, is, is if you look at the history of um, HIV advocacy, it took a long time, um, actually. Uh, the 1995 was the first time where the WHO put in place a TRIPS agreement, which was that you can waive patents for vaccines or for medications if they're life-saving. And in 1996, antiretroviral therapy became available for those in US and Europe. And despite so much opposition, pharmaceutical companies did not make these and did not release their patents um, for production of ART worldwide. By 2001, Pfizer actually made $47 billion on something called fluconazole, which was mandatory to treat cryptococcal meningitis. And then by 2001, India actually decided to make ART for the world at less than a dollar a day. And South Africa started buying from India and pharmaceutical companies actually sued South Africa. And as you know, with PEPFAR, ART access expanded. And just last year, a year ago, uh, and it's ironic that it's India and, and South Africa since the two variants were described in these places, but um, India and South Africa went to the World Trade Organization and they said, you have to invoke the TRIPS waiver because these vaccines are coming. And just because we haven't had a lot of infection yet, they could come. And WTO said no. And then Biden got elected and in March, 2021, he got a letter from pharmaceutical companies saying, whatever you do, don't listen to India and South Africa in their appeal for IP waivers. And then in May, 2021, Biden ha very halfway said, yeah, I think we should have intellectual property waivers and nothing has been done since. So um, this is where we are in the advocacy. That's why we, I mean, MSF is advocating a lot and so is the WHO, but um, we're hoping an academic movement can make some, some changes. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Monica. Uh, this is Lucia from the uh, mission, from the hybrid model. Uh, thank you for that amazing presentation. Uh, that was great. And thank you for all the advocacy. I think everybody in Global Health is very interested in seeing more vaccine equity. So I'm going to start. I had a couple of questions. Maybe I can start with mine and then we can ask some of the chat questions. There's many in there, uh, but we can save those uh, maybe. Uh, so I, my question was regarding like, it's great to have so many uh, COVID, COVID vaccines available and more rolling out, but kind of the implications for equity and what does this like create in countries? For example, uh, we work in Guatemala and what we're seeing is that since they receive donations, they're receiving different types of vaccines, but they are sticking to the same vaccine um, schedule. So we have people that are receiving a booster already, but there's people that only have one dose of one of the first vaccines they got. So it's creating kind of this like immunological like inequity. So can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, I mean, it, it is true that Guatemala received and so did Brazil and Chile and they, they received a lot of the China Chinese made vaccines. And to be fair, 
by the way, um, it was not as if the US was or or any other country was trying to donate vaccines. Uh, China and Russia were trying very hard to sell them or uh, or donate them at low prices. And so, um, uh, and so that was really a failure of these other countries. But yes, these kind of massive different types of vaccines and vaccine schedules have been very confusing and many people have actually come if they can and got booster shots, especially if they had Sinopharm or Sinovac there. And I think that's true that if you had those two dose vaccines, I wouldn't even say over 60, I would say everyone should get um, uh, a third shot. Perfect. Thank you. So I'm going to start uh, filling some of the chat questions. So there's three on Novavax. Uh, Novavax. So I'm just going to read them together. So one is the update uh, on approval for that. Uh, the other one uh, that I saw was um, how will like Novavax like be rolled out? And do you think it's going to be like a game changer for low income countries? And the last one on Novavax is about why it took so long to get that data in if this is something we've been hearing from uh, er, mid last year? Yes, so I will say um, um, that the Novavax vaccine, I think is very exciting because it was actually studied um, with variants, meaning at least alpha, beta, gamma, there was a certain proportion, it's just starting with delta. And also it, it, it kind of has a longer, piece of the spike protein that's in there. So hopefully you raise maybe a more diverse immune response. We don't know um, about Omicron. Um, so I do think it's gonna be a game changer. And why do I think it's gonna be a game changer? There's vaccine hesitancy against the uh, genetic material vaccines. It's, it's very unfortunate, but that's what it is. And I think that will change. I think there are people in this country who will get the Novavax when they would not have gotten the mRNA vaccines. And I think that's true of other places uh, where there are more vaccine hesitancy. And I think it's gonna be a very exciting vaccine. And I'm, I, why is it not being pushed? Well, it has to do with the US in a way um, but to be fair, they haven't filed for their EUA here. They said they're going to file by the end of the year, but they have filed with the, with the EU. And as soon as it's filed with the EU, it's going to be approved by the Dubai Joe. Perfect. Thank you. So and the report just, from this uh, morning, EU said they're going to approve it like within very soon. And uh, just following up on what you're saying about the vaccine hesitancy, uh, there's a question on that. So. Uh, is there much evidence out there to suggest that folks who are vaccine hesitant would be open to a non-mRNA vaccine? Uh, this is something you mentioned. Is Do you yes. know if there's some evidence for this? There is evidence, especially among parents of children who've been reluctant to give them the 5 to 11-year-old Pfizer vaccine, for example. So India has already studied it in children. And um, there is like surveys where people are like, I'm waiting for that vaccine because, because it's very traditional. Perfect. And uh, just, I'm going to read one more and then we're going to jump to a student question. So uh, this is on the pediatric, just uh, talking more about pediatric. Uh, uh, so since Pfizer is approved and Moderna is in clinical trials, uh, what about uh, lower middle income countries? Is Astra, do you know if AstraZeneca is in trial for pediatrics? Well, it's a great question because um, this country uh, is really the only that has been urging five to 11 year old vaccines um, to this degree. Uh, UK is, uh, uh, ch um, Canada just approved the five to 11 year old vaccine, but the way they said it, it's in no way gonna be mandated and it really just has to be a parental decision. And they do understand that parents need some to get more safety data on those vaccines. Um, so we are the only country no one's mandating except, uh, unfortunately, California, who is mandating vaccines even before they're approved to go to school, which is um, pretty unusual for, for and, and likely is going to affect uh, low-income uh, uh, racial and ethnic minorities more in terms of um, needing some more time to have safety on the vaccines before they vaccinate their children. So this is a very punitive uh, California thing. Um, which I hope they'll change because um, uh, many children aren't going to be able to go to school in January in LA. Uh, however, I do think the pediatric vaccine is good and it's safe, but they do respond pretty vigorously, which is why the 5 to 11-year-old vaccine is 10 micrograms of Pfizer as opposed to 30 micrograms. And I think that's 
really better. Um, and there is a myocarditis risk. And um, the myocarditis risk is more after the second dose, and it's more in males. And um, and the spacing out of doses by eight weeks has been shown in Canada. We're still waiting for the publication, but they put it in their um, in their press release. It's been shown to decrease the risk of myocarditis. So I'm very much advising people who are vaccinating their children to space it out by eight weeks to risk, reduce the risk of myocarditis. I have two sons, and I've done um, my, uh, eight weeks for both of them. Perfect. Thank you, Monica. So now we're going to have a student ask. Uh, you're going to hear him, but you're going to still see me. Okay. Hi. Yeah. My name is Blake. Um, I'm one of the master students with IGHS. I just want to say also thank you for um, answering that question about myocarditis, the risk of myocarditic infractions for men who take the vaccine, because uh, I'm also a little bit worried. I was also worried about that for my booster shot. Um, so thank you for that information. Um, I had a question about... Um, Moderna, the case right now um, for the NIH or the U.S. suing Moderna um, for some of like, or at least for the for right to creating um, the vaccine. And I was wondering um, if they are successful with their suit, what future implications that will have um, for like the for future patent laws, um, not only affecting the U.S. but also like the trips, like the WHO trips. Because um, I know Biden said that if um, that if he was elected, he was going to uh, waive the patents or at least put temporarily do that. So I was just kind of wondering what information you had on that or your sort of your thoughts on that. Um, I think that's a great question. Number one, um, the approval for vaccines for all, uh, for boosters for all down to 18, again, is a very US centric thing. And um, there have been very many concerns raised for a booster shot for young men um, after the two dose vaccine. So, so that is, we're all doing things differently and there's, there's um, quite a bit of politics involved. Um, so in terms of, uh, of the Moderna vaccine, I mean, it was made by it was made by the company, but it's there was a lot of intellectual input from the NIH and Barney Graham, um, you know, is a long-term NIH vaccinologist that really participated in the production of this vaccine, and so it's profoundly um, uh, uh, strange that Moderna is not acknowledging the NIH's input. And beyond that, taxpayer dollars because they took money from Operation Warp Speed paid at least 10 billion in development um, of the Moderna vaccine. And they're still holding on to their patent and, um, and to profit. So Moderna is being even more horrible than Pfizer in a way because like they took the money and then they're not sharing and, and I find them deplorable, but, um, but I hope they lose their suit. And, and I hope that that will have greater impact for uh, vaccine access um, from Moderna. But I don't know if they will. The government is, I mean, we're also suing, um, the government's also suing at some point to get PrEP um, because all the clinical trials were, were done with NIH money and Gilead owns the, owns the product, but um, they're not successful yet. Uh, great. Thank you very much, uh, Monica. Just to close us up because we're right on time. Sorry we didn't get to all of your questions. There were some great questions in here. But uh, Karen Byrne asks uh, what we can do to participate in the White Coat for Global COVID Equity Movement. Great. I'm so glad you asked that because it literally just started. There's someone named Michael Wilkes at UC Davis, who some of you may know, who's had a lot of experience in professional writing and journalism and had worked for NPR. Um, and because of that, we decided to start it with just a document, a launch, e either an op-ed somewhere or uh, on December 11th, because why did we choose that date? That's the one year anniversary of the Pfizer uh, EUA. It's tragic that it's a year later and we don't have global vaccine equity. So we just started, we have a document circulating. Mike Reed, by the way, from IGHS is doing a uh, bike run for global vaccine equity. And I advertise that as well in this comment, but just email me and I'll get you on the list. And we're gonna just form a list and we're going to, and CUGH getting them involved is great. And we're gonna have this, this is gonna be as massive of an academic movement as we can. For right now, it's gonna be across academic settings. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Hopefully your email is flooded with requests because this is a very important mission. Well, uh, but thank you very much for your presentation, amazing presentation, and thank you everybody for uh, joining thank us. You. Uh, and yeah, we'll see you in January for our next grand rounds. <laughs>